All right, welcome again, everybody, um, to our SB 1383 chat with CalRecycle for the month of May. This is our monthly webinar series on 1383 implementation and our second webinar uh, specific to edible food recovery. This month, we're going to be talking about recovery of prepared foods, which has been a pretty hot topic as we move into 2024 and tier two implementation. And we have some really great panelists with us today to share what is possible for this kind of recovery. Um, and this will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel uh, once available. So let's go ahead and get started. Can we go next slide? Well, I'll, oh, slide went away. I, I will also just take this time to introduce myself. My name is Danielle Osborne. I'm an environmental scientist with CalRecycle. My work focuses specifically on edible food recovery. Um, I'm joined by my manager, Kyle Pogue, and many other colleagues behind the scenes. Um, so we will be available today to moderate questions and host hopefully a, a lively discussion um, after we hear from our panelists. Okay, I'm seeing the slides re, looks like they're loading again, there we go. All right, now we can go to the next slide. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, we're, we're talking about recovery of prepared foods, and uh, this has been a topic of conversation because as we go into January 1st, 2024, the um, edible food recovery requirements will extend to tier two commercial edible food generators. So if you've tuned into an edible food recovery webinar before, you've probably seen this slide. This is showing that phased implementation for those requirements that commercial edible food generators need to recover the maximum amount of their surplus edible food. So in 2024, this requirement will extend to tier two generators, which are local education agencies, large events and large venues, state agency cafeterias, restaurants, hotels, and health facilities that meet certain thresholds. So much of the food that these kinds of generators have to be recovered are prepared foods, which can require different recovery methods from more traditional food bank models. And so in today's webinar, we will be discussing recovery of these kinds of prepared foods and having our panelists talking about and showing what is possible. Next slide. We're lucky enough to be joined by four panelists today. First up, we're going to hear from Vanessa Mello, the program coordinator with San Diego County Department of Environmental Health and Quality. Then we'll hear from Claire Turner, Senior Manager of Sustainability with the Good Eating Company. She'll be joined by Alicia Jenish McCarran, the Culinary Director with the Good Eating Company. And then lastly, we'll hear from Brian Paquette, Director of the Community Exchange Program with Hollywood Food Coalition. We'll be running through each of their presentations and hold the Q&A for the end. Next slide. Here are some instructions, some housekeeping things for that Q&A session. So questions should focus on 1383 edible food recovery implementation only. Um, that's what we're going to be focusing on, the questions that we will prioritize. Um, and then if, but if, as I said, we'll be waiting for the end of those presentations to run the Q&A. That being said, you can drop your questions into that Q&A feature uh, as they come up. And this Q&A feature can be found in line with other buttons like chat and participants. We will not be using the chat or raised hand function for Q&A. We'll be specifically using that Q&A feature. So please use that if you would like your question answered live today. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be going focusing on questions on the edible food recovery topic, and we'll go through those questions on a first come first served basis, and of course aim to get to as many people as possible. Any questions that we do not get to um, during the webinar today, we will be following up with you on as well. And when we get to your question, staff will give you the ability to unmute yourself. And so when called on, please unmute yourself, state your name, affiliation, your question, uh, including any additional context, if you'd like to include that. Next slide. We also would love to emphasize uh, and encourage peer sharing. 
So through our involvement in regional group meetings across the state, we've seen the value that peer sharing can, can bring to help finding solutions with edible food recovery implementation. So we really help, hope to facilitate that here um, today. And if you have something that you would like to share um, an experience, or maybe if you have something to add into a question that somebody else had asked, please drop in the Q&A peer share um, before your question or comment. And similar to how I said on the previous slide, our staff will allow you to unmute and share that. Now I'm going to pass it off to Michelle Martin, the branch chief of our financial resource management branch and Kyle Pogue to share some funding updates. Next slide, please. Thanks so much, Danielle, and good afternoon, everyone. We've been really busy with many of our programs and funding opportunities, and I wanted to provide a quick update today. Um, Cal Recycle staff are currently reviewing applications for our, our organics grant program. This includes anaerobic digestion and large composting projects. Our allocation for this program is $150 million, and we hope to award those at the end of this year. And over the last couple of years, we've awarded $213 million in grants for our organics grant program, SB 1383 local assistance grants, food rescue, co-digestion, and community composting grants. And this slide provides some really great statistics. Um, 620 projects have been funded, uh, 4.9 tons diverted, and 242 million meals served. Next slide, please. Uh, last week, Cal Recycle announced 14 new grant awards for the SB 1383 Local Assistance Program, totaling $6 million. The latest projects will help communities cover the costs of new bins, education and outreach materials, record keeping, subscriptions, administration costs, and assistance to meet local procurement targets. These 14 communities join the 455 who received previous 1383 Local Assistance funding. These awards will be distributed contingent on submitted items requested by the department. And the criteria for the latest allocation is currently in development and will be communicate a draft criteria as soon as it's ready. I wanted to point out some eligible costs related to edible food recovery that are included in the current criteria. And we anticipate this to remain unchanged for the new criteria. This includes staffing, consultants, and funding for inspections software to, ma uh, to match donors with food banks, record keeping and reporting software, trucks, equipment and refrigeration equipment, uh, coolers and packing materials. And with that, I will turn it over to Kyle. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Danielle, you hearing me okay? Okay, great. Thank you. It's it's my pleasure to to finally be able to announce that we've awarded the community composting grant program. This is our second cycle, uh, awarded for four point two million dollars for eight regional projects, and uh, this is building upon our first cycle uh, that we awarded uh, one point five million dollars and funded ultimately about one hundred and twenty community composting sites around the state that resulted in these types of benefits that you guys see in the slide here. Um, next slide, please. And it, it, this slide represents these eight different regions. And I want to acknowledge that uh, funding was awarded to two primary entities, uh, LA Compost uh, in the Los Angeles in the, in the white um, there on, on the region. And then also uh, to California Alliance for Community Composting for the other regions, but also know that, that CAC is working with many different regional partners in implementation of this. So this may be of interest to you uh, if you're interested in, in starting a community composting site in your area, and I would encourage you to get in contact with these grantees uh, if you are interested in doing so. And if you haven't met a community composter, you need to do it. Fantastic people doing great work out there. Um, so I'm happy to tell you about that. And that's it for me, Danielle. Back to you. Thanks. All right. Thank you both, Michelle and Kyle there. 
One other update is that we're making some minor edits to our edible food recovery capacity planning calculator tool based on some feedback we've received, and we're aiming for sharing that updated version sometime this summer. So as a reminder, the next round of capacity planning is due August 1st, 2024 for the time period of January 1st, 2025 through December 31st, 2034. So stay tuned for that. It will be noticed on uh, our 1383 or SLCP listserv. Next slide, please. All right, now I'm going to welcome Vanessa Mello. Vanessa is a program coordinator in the County of San Diego Department of Environmental Health and Quality Food and Housing Division, where she's worked for 16 years. She leads the charitable feeding program there and works as a food safety lead in various groups that work to improve the local food system. Vanessa, you can take it away. Thank you, Danielle. Can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, as Danielle said, my name is Vanessa Mello, and I work down here in San Diego County for the Department of Environmental Health and Quality. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about safe food donation, um, and I want to kind of throw out a, a little disclaimer. Um, although all environmental health jurisdictions throughout the state um, follow and implement the California Retail Food Code, there may be some differences in our procedures or even our local ordinances um, that might cause us to do things to do, do things a little bit differently. So if there's something that I'm saying today that doesn't sound like your county or your jurisdiction, um, that might be the reason. All right, next slide, let's jump in. All right, in environmental health, we implement the California Retail Food Code through regulation of retail food facilities, which includes charitable feeding and service. This is kind of a longstanding myth that um, people assume that if they're not selling food, um, that they are not regulated under the California Retail Food Code. But the code does actually not distinguish whether or not there is a charge for the food. If the operations fit under the definition of retail food, um, then they would need to follow the California Retail Food Code. Environmental health supports food donation, and locally, we provide guidance and education on safe food handling for retail food operations those that generate waste and also food recovery, food recovery organizations. A couple sections of the California Retail Food Code that I did want to point out, and it looks like the first one I typed twice, so sorry about that. Um, section 114433 actually references the California Good um, Samaritan Act, which is that liability protection, right, for those that are donating food. Um, and it spells out who can donate to who. So food facilities can donate to a nonprofit organization or directly to an end consumer. Whereas a person or individual can donate to a nonprofit organization, but not directly to an end consumer. And the thought is there that there's gonna be um, some checks and balances or some vetting of the food that's coming in by that nonprofit, making sure that it's from an approved source, that it's been handled safely, that it's not something that was prepared in a home kitchen, et cetera. And this section also references um, food expiration dates and that food um, past an expiration date can be donated. Um, as most of us are aware, the expiration dates are really, um, really more for quality and really not um, an indication of the food safety of the food. Um, and so they can be donated after the expiration if they've been evaluated, looks good, smells good, been held in temperature, et cetera. Um, and then section 114435 was something that was added just a few years ago, and it specifically talks about food recovery promotion and says that environmental health inspectors should support and promote food donation. Um, I think this is something that was a really important addition to our code. Um, when I came into environmental health 16 years ago, um, food donation was kind of more of a dirty word, right? And something that, you know, we all feared and it's so dangerous. And, you know, once we really kind of looked at it more closely, um, realizing that, you know, food, there's a lot of safe food out there that can be donated safely. And there's a lot of people in need um, that could really benefit from receiving it. And so this was something that was added a few years ago. Next slide. 
Um, I just wanted to touch on a little bit what we do here locally in San Diego. Um, so our environmental health program really holds a supportive role in SB 1383 efforts. Um, so we, um, I personally participate in a couple different technical advisory committees for SB 1383, um, and I'm really just there as a resource. Um, we partner very closely with our San Diego County Solid Waste Planning and Recycling staff and our San Diego Food System Alliance um, for many different things, but a, a few of them that we've done are some different guidance documents. So we have a food donation liability FAQ. We have a too good to waste document, um, which is something that we can give out to our food facility operators that talks about um, safe food donation. Uh, we provide ongoing training internally to our food inspectors. Um, so just kind of, you know, drilling into them that, you know, food donation is perfectly acceptable and that we promote it. We're here as a resource and not as a barrier to that and that we um, in our inspections can provide that education. We were featured in a food donation video, so we had one of our inspectors wearing her little health inspector uh, shirt going on a video that's going to be featured on their website, basically saying, hey, us in the health department, we, we promote food donation, food donation is okay. Um, and we send out regular um, mailers or emails. We have a mass email system. It's called Gov Delivery, where we send out a monthly newsletter to all of our permitted food facilities. And we usually provide different food safety tips in this mailer. Um, and so we often, as one of our topics, choose safe food donation. Um, and then, of course, as I said, we're here as a resource. So um, for me personally, I'm participating in some different technical advisory committees, but we also have um, our inspectors that are a resource to their food facilities, and we have an information specialist as well. Next slide. Okay, so what food cannot be donated? Um, the California Retail Food Code does have some, some specific requirements for certain food or processes where the food is uh, has a time limit before it needs to be either consumed or destroyed. Um, so it's not that the code says this food can't be donated. It's just that there are some time limits that it can be served, consumed, whether it's for a fee or, or donation. And the first one are foods using a process called time as a public health control. Uh, we call it TPHC. This is something that's commonly used for um, foods that their quality would be sacrificed if they were held hot or cold. So things like sushi rice, uh, pizza by the slice, uh, spring rolls, and it's meant for food um, that's intended to be immediately consumed. And these foods can essentially sit out of temperature for a maximum of four hours, um, at which time they need to be either consumed or destroyed. So this is not something that they would be able to do this process and then package it up and save it for later in the refrigerator to be donated the next day. Once it's going under this process, it's not allowed to be saved past four hours. There's also Korean and Vietnamese rice cakes, um, which have their own uh, very specific exemption in the Retail Food Code, and they can be held out of temperature for a maximum of 24 hours. So same idea, if they are being held out of temperature for any given amount of time, it's not something that they would be able to save for later to donate. Um, hot foods held on a mobile food truck or a mobile cart must be destroyed at the end of the working day. And same for hot foods or foods held between 41 and 45. Uh, to make it simple, I'll say any foods above 41 degrees at temporary food events or street fairs. They also need to be destroyed at the end of the working day. Next slide. So how can food facilities safely donate food? Um, I get asked this question all the time and it's actually a really simple answer. The same way that they make and sell food for their business. Um, there's no difference in the food handling requirements for food that will be sold or food that will be donated. It's all meant for human consumption and it must be handled properly and all the same food safety principles apply. So there's not a different or special practice for food that will be donated. It's really all the same. 
Next slide. I wanted to touch briefly um, on our inspections and kind of what we look for, or what they entail. Um, we do something called a risk-based inspection. And so we're really zeroing in and focusing on these risk factors that essentially if they are done improperly um, can directly contribute to foodborne illness. And so the Centers for Disease Control or the CDC has identified these five major risk factors that if they're done improperly in a restaurant or food facility can directly contribute to foodborne illness. And they are improper holding temperatures. Um, so they need to make sure food, hot food is held at 135 degrees or above or cold food is held at 41 degrees or below. Poor personal hygiene is proper hand washing, proper glove use, um, not working when you're sick, improper cooking temperatures of foods that have a required internal cooking temperature, so a lot of meats that you'll see listed there and eggs, um, or reheating food. So if there's cooked food that's going to be reheated to put in a steam table, that has to hit a minimum temperature of 165 in the reheat process. And food from unsafe sources, so um, no food from a private home, all meat and poultry must be USDA inspected, and of course shellfish from certified dealers. And contaminated equipment is another important one, um, no cross contamination, so no cutting raw chicken on a cutting board and then rinsing it off and immediately cutting lettuce for a salad. Um, and of course, just how they're sanitizing their food contact surfaces in general. Next slide. I wanted to pull out kind of some of those that are more specific and more directly related to food donation. Um, and of course, that's going to be holding temperatures. So maintaining cold foods at 41 degrees or below and hot foods at 135 degrees or above. And cooling. Cooling is a very uh, specific process. So when you have food that's hot, you have no choice, right, but to cool it and go through that danger zone, right, which is where bacteria grows, grows the best um, to get it to cold. Um, and so really that process needs to be done rapidly or as fast as possible so that you don't allow any time for the bacteria to grow. Um, something that's not, you know, in the code or a requirement is that food um, that's going to be donated is already cold or frozen. But as a best practice, that's something that we would definitely um, recommend. Um, that the food facilities or the restaurants actually do the cooling process before it's donated. A lot of our charitable feeding organizations don't have um, the necessary infrastructure. They have a lot more regulatory flexibility when it comes to their infrastructure and their equipment. So they may not be equipped with, you know, a beautiful walk-in refrigerator and all these commercial refrigerators um, that can really help properly cool uh, food rapidly. And so we definitely would recommend that the food facilities that do have that um, cool it down for them and even freeze it is best. Um, and I threw hand washing in there because that one is the most important of all. Um, improper hand washing is the number one cause of foodborne illness. Um, so whether it's a food recovery organization or a um, food facility, hand washing, um, properly washing of hands should be should be a big one. Next slide. Okay, food safety during transport. This is also um, another really important one for food donation because usually the food uh, that's being donated needs to be transported somewhere. Um, we've seen a lot of issues in this arena with uh, food recovery organizations because they're really run off of volunteers and finding volunteer drivers and enough volunteer drivers to go pick up all the food um, is really challenging. Um, but the food in transport really shouldn't go much out of temperature. So cold foods should not exceed, oops, sorry, go back one, I think. There you go. Should not exceed um, 45 degrees and hot foods must not go below 135 degrees. And the total transport time must not exceed 30 minutes. Um, what a lot of times we do see is that there's maybe one volunteer driver, um, they start in the morning and they need to stop at multiple places to pick up, you know, many different donations. And by the time they get to the distribution site, you know, it may have been an hour and a half, two hours. And so the food from the first place is already getting close to 65 degrees, 70 degrees. 
then it still has to be unloaded from the car and then it has to be set up for distribution. I mean, you're really starting to look at a really long period of time where food is, is temperature abused and really unsafe. Um, and so we really um, work on this transport time. And I know our local feed, food banks, so Feeding San Diego and San Diego Food Bank do a really good job at this and working with their partners, helping them set up routes, um, and trying to figure out the best uh, way that they cannot exceed the 30 minute travel time. Um, of course, if you have a beautiful refrigerated truck like this one Feeding San Diego has, um, the 30 minutes would not apply because you would be able to refrigerate and hold the cold food at 41 or below. Next slide. In the food facility, they have training requirements. So um, for food facilities, that handle open, potentially hazardous food or perishable food, um, they are required to have at least one person who has a food safety manager certificate. And this is an eight hour course with exam and they must take it or renew it every five years. And depending on your jurisdiction, um, food handlers, well, I'll say this, all food handlers um, are required to have a, a food handler card. It may be a little bit nuanced or different per jurisdiction on what food handlers need it. If, if they're handling only packaged food, they may not need it in certain counties. Um, the, the California Retail Food Code does describe um, what's required for food handlers. Um, however, if you're like San Diego County, we had a food handler training program prior to 2009, our own, it's in our local ordinance. And so we are exempt or grandfathered in from this section. And so our requirements are a little bit different, but um, food handlers should have a food handler card as well. And for us locally, it's something that they renew every three years. Next slide. So what foods are considered safe for donation? Um, really, this should be up to the food facilities. Um, they are the experts, they are trained, they are already running a food business, um, and they should be the ones to decide what foods are edible. Um, so I know, um, you know, as different recycling specialists or, or folks are going in, they're feeling this kind of pressure to evaluate the food. And really that should be up to the food facility. So, you know, not expecting you guys to be the, the person who's making those food safety evaluations. Um, something that they may need a little help with is determining um, their limitations. So a lot of times, and I'm sure you all have experienced this already, um, they'll say, oh no, um, I can't donate the food in my hot case because the health department said I can't. Or the health department said there's, you know, a 72 hour time limit on this, or, you know, there's a lot of different things that are, are said. And as you can see from the presentation, our California Retail Food Code really doesn't have a huge amount of limitations on that. Um, and so kind of really digging in with them a little bit deeper and seeing where this comes from is, is the limitation that they're talking about the time frame. Is it an internal corporate policy that they're following? Um, is it something um, that their food banks have spoken to them about? So I know that, you know, some of our food banks, they have different um, policies. So they don't accept hot food or they don't accept food that's been at a self-service buffet line. Well, code doesn't specifically say that can't be donated that way, um, but there may be some other limitations. And so just kind of trying to help the food facility maybe determine where that comes from. And if it's something that can be changed or modified will be helpful. And just realizing that there's really a cultural shift still needed. Um, most, most restaurants or food facilities, they don't, they don't really have a lot of food um, to donate. They shouldn't have, especially if they're run well, they shouldn't have a lot of excess food. Um, and usually in my experience, if they do have some extra, they're giving it to their staff, you know, to take home to their families or they make it a shift meal. Um, but they, it is gonna take a little time. Unless they had a specific calling for food donation, um, they may not already be doing it. Next slide. And I definitely recommend um, creating a relationship with your local uh, environmental health um, jurisdiction if you haven't already. Um, take a look at their website, see if there's an information line, 
um, somebody that you can refer the food facilities op operators to if they have food safety related questions. Um, for example, we have an information specialist, our duty specialist who literally sits at that desk all day and takes all kinds of calls from the public and from our facilities asking questions about food safety um, and permitting, et cetera. And um, we have given this this information line phone number and email to all of our local city jurisdictions that are implementing SB 1383 so that if there is a food safety question, they actually can just give them the, that phone number and email and direct them to us. Next slide. Oh, and that's the end. Um, I'll be happy to answer questions when all the presenters are finished at the end. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Vanessa. And we did get a, a handful of questions, definitely. Um, so thank you for that great overview of the um, health requirement or the safety requirements of the California Retail Food Code um, that helped lay the foundation for safe food recovery. Now I'm going to turn it over to Claire Turner and Alicia Janesh McCarran. Claire is the Senior Manager of Sustainability for the Good Eating Company, where she works to ensure the the business is playing an active role in building a more sustainable, just, and resilient food system. She holds an MBA in sustainability leadership and a Master of Science in Sustainable Food Systems from Prescott College. Claire's professional experience spans the food chain from food innovation consultancy, nonprofit organizational management, to hospitality and urban farming. And I'm sorry, next slide, please. Okay. And Alicia is the culinary director at the San Francisco LinkedIn campus for the Good Eating Company. She has been cooking professionally for 30 years and has built a career career long relationships with farmers, sustainable seafood vendors, and those who practice regenerative agriculture. Whenever you're ready, Claire. Thank you so much, Danielle, and thank you, Vanessa. Um, as Danielle mentioned, my name is Claire Turner, and I'm joined by my colleague Alicia Janish McCarran. Um, we are excited to talk to you guys about what is possible with food recovery. Um, I first met uh, Danielle and Kyle a few months ago when we were trying to navigate where we fell in the tier uh, categories, which I see has come up actually already in the in the Q and A. So. Um, it's an active question. Uh, Good Eating Company is a food service company, but we're trying to do things differently. Um, we primarily work in the corporate services sector, but we also work in universities. Um, our kitchens are chef driven. We prepare simple food, but we do it exceptionally well. We care about our farmers, where the food comes from, that the food is delicious and it's authentically executed. We also care about the end life of the food that we're crafting. So as we'll get into in this presentation, sustainability is at the core of who we are as a company and what drives our chefs to be best in class. We measure and report on our food waste and we work to avoid sending any edible food to comp we work to avoid sending edible food to compost um, by recovering it with food recovery partners. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this slide explains our sustainability and CSR strategy. And the reason why I'm sharing this is that this is sort of the, the why beh internally behind how I convince our teams um, that this matters. So at the beginning of every year, we set um, our strategy. Um, it ties up into our parent company's um, overall uh, CSR and sustainability strategy. So our parent company is Sodexo. Um, and they have really robust sustainability goals related to reducing carbon and reducing waste, increasing plant-based eating, and our social impact. Um, so food recovery hits on a few of those pillars, um, which is why it's a, a really easy and exciting um, focus area for us. So um, if you can advance. So reducing waste, that's our second pillar. Um, and one of the ways that we focus on that, especially here in California, is we have 100% participation in food recovery where it's eligible. So um, all of our chefs who are working in on site in kitchens um, are encouraged to find a partner organization um, and to start their own food recovery program. Next slide, please. 
Um, here are just some of the results with our program over the past year. So um, we use a food waste management tool called Waste Watch powered by Lean Path to measure um, both of our kitchen waste and our post-consumer waste. Um, and across the board, all good eating company sites ha have reduced our waste by 46% to date. Um, additionally, in the last year, we've donated um, a little over 15,000 pounds um, or $25,000-ish <laughs> worth of food. Um, I say ish because that's calculated using an estimate. Um, and that's approximately 13,000 meals. This is just a snapshot. We've actually probably done a lot more than this, but as probably a lot of other operators on this call will attest to getting um, accurate metrics and reporting on this is um, one of the tricky pieces to this puzzle. And here's a picture of me and two of my colleagues um, on a volunteer day we recently had at the San Francisco Food Bank. Next slide, please. Um, so once again, um, tying this back to the why. So as a company, we have this um, science-based target um, to reduce our carbon impact by 34% by 2025. Um, and we do also have a net zero target under review. Um, as some of you are probably aware, um, that's a big reason why SB 1383 exists in the first place is that we, as a society, as we you know think of compost as the end life, um, it actually is an emitter. So we're continuing to emit methane even as we're moving to compost. So um, moving towards more food recovery, edible food recovery is um, a way that we can all work to continue to reduce our carbon. Um, organic waste accounts for about 8% of our global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so these inputs are you know, generating big impacts on the environment. And um, additionally, it, this is compliance. We're um, required to comply um, by state law uh, to divert our waste um, edible food potential edible food uh, recovery. Next slide, please. Um, this graphic is probably familiar to everyone on this call, um, but this is the food recovery hierarchy. Um, so as you can see, we work in our kitchens to um, reduce uh, waste at the source. Um, and then, um, you know, anything that is possible to be recovered, we're working to have it go to, to hungry folks. Um, and then in certain instances, it's also diverted to animal feed. Um, and then, of course, it, it can go to, to local composting facilities. And then um, if that doesn't exist, it does end up in the landfill. Um, next slide, please. Um, so here's a little bit more of the how. So as I mentioned, um, our parent company is Sodexo, um, and Sodexo, when tasked with um, this big ask from the state of California for figuring out how are we going to recover edible food, um, put together this comprehensive food recovery and donation toolkit. Um, and this toolkit makes it very easy for our sites um, to figure out the best way to set up a program and to make sure that it's following all of those health and safety um, uh, requirements that Vanessa clearly outlined. Um, this toolkit is is pretty adaptable, um, and so um, our teams have found it quite useful. Um, I included two logos here of two of our partners um, that we've worked really successfully with in Northern California. One is Chefs to End Hunger, and we'll get into more detail in a minute about how that partnership works. And then the other is White Pony Express. And I think I saw Pete Olson on the call. Um, so a little shout out to White Pony. Um, they're great as well. So um, happy to answer more questions in the Q&A about our food recovery toolkit. Um, as I said, we, you know, Sodexo as a company operates thousands of sites across the United States. So we really needed um, uh, something that was straightforward, adaptable to a lot of different locations. Good Eating Company has far fewer sites. Um, we have about 50 nationwide and about um, anywhere from 10 to 20 within the state of California. So um, I actually have visibility into all of those sites and I'm able to connect with our chefs um, and our on-site teams to figure out the best programs that work for them. Um, but having all of the information outlined to make sure that they're 
in compliance with both of our, our company policy and also with the state um, regulations is really helpful. Next slide. All right, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, um, Alicia, and she can talk us through um, this great partnership that we have with Chefs to End Hunger. Hi. Yeah, so Chefs to End Hunger, we've been using uh, since our return to office um, after the pandemic, um, and it's been incredible. Before that, we were using just a local charity, and uh, like Vanessa outlined, it, I had some concerns about really wonderful volunteers transporting lots of food in their cars. Um, so Chefs to End Hunger does it really safely in refrigerated uh, trucks through our uh, Vesta, one of our main produce providers. So they provide us with these boxes that have three um, aluminum hotel pans. Um, so we fill them, chill them appropriately at the end of service and then label. You can label up to three different things in the box. Um, and then we refrigerate it overnight and then we get a very early um, morning uh, delivery at 5 a.m. And that driver picks it up and delivers it to um, different, I think it's about six different charities um, here in San Francisco um, that day. So it's a it's a wonderful at no cost to us um, program. They also provide us data at the end of the month so we can provide that back to our client. Um, and they tell us how many pounds of food um, and then quantify it into a USDA meal, um, which is about 1.2 pounds. So it's pretty awesome. Uh, very easy for our staff to use. Um, and I, I it's a, couldn't make it easier to donate food. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Only a few things they can't take, obviously, anything that's too liquidy, um, and then sushi, raw fish, and stuff like that. But uh, that's how we pack it. You know, we make sure they each box comes with um, a plastic bag if it's necessary to line it and prevent spilling. Um, and that tells you how full to make it. We do track it. Um, just to keep our staff trained, we have them lay, weigh it on the lean path too, just because we, we really want our staff um, weighing any type of waste. Um, even if we're repurposing it in our unit, we weigh it just so we can um, sort of dig into our, our food waste as much as possible and track every every sort of waste. Yeah, can you and go back one more slide? Oh. One, yeah. So, um, as Alicia outlined, um, this is a kit that comes um, pre packed and it's it includes three aluminum um, pans um, in one of these boxes. And then they have really clear guidelines on what um, they want and what they don't want. And then we label um, each of the pans, put it in the box, um, and then it's picked up um, by Vesta, who as Alicia mentioned, is one of our produce distributors. So it's a really streamlined solution um, for our chefs. They don't have to place an additional order um, for some for a volunteer to come pick it up. Um, if we're already getting a delivery of produce that week, um, Vesta will we can we just add this to the order and then they pick up the boxes. Next slide. Um, yeah, so Lean Path um, is a really great tool for us. I saw a question pop into the chat that Lean Path is pretty expensive for for small businesses. Totally hear that. Um, we are a, a much larger uh, corporation, so we do. Um, you know, we are able to to use this, and our clients often are the ones asking us to use this in in all of our sites. Um, I would recommend using some kind of manual tool to. Um, start to record your waste in your kitchen if you're interested in um, in these metrics because it's really neat to see um, not only how your team can work to reduce kitchen waste, but also once you get a, a donation program up and running, um, you can see that diversion. Um, and that's a very encouraging number to see as well. So um, there's a lot of ways that you can do it just with a clipboard and a piece of paper, and you don't need a fancy um, tablet. Uh, you just need a kitchen scale, um, and you just need to weigh, uh, weigh your waste. So um, with that, we'll go to the last slide. Thank you so much. And I know um, Alicia might have to jump off of this call, but um, our emails are both here and um, I'll be sure to share any questions that come up um, with her as well. Yeah. Actually, my meeting was canceled, so I can't oh. stay. <laughs>
Thanks, everyone. Okay, great. Thank you both. Um, and as we we are getting a lot of questions too, so reminder, if we don't get to your question during the webinar, we will be um, carrying out that follow up as well. So thank you, Claire and Alicia. And now, last but not least, um, we are going to hear from Brian Paquette of Hollywood Food Coalition. Brian has been working on improving LA County food systems and food access since 2018, scaling a variety of efforts. In May 2020, Brian transitioned from a volunteer at Hollywood Food Coalition to staff to build the Community Exchange Program, a missing piece in the food recovery landscape aimed at providing small to medium-sized social service agencies with the food that they want when they need it. He's excited to take the next leap with the program, which will help more Angelinos access high quality food and continue to make our food systems more efficient and equitable. Thanks, Brian, whenever you're ready. Thanks, Danielle. <clears throat> Excuse me, and thanks for everyone for having me here. Um, excited to get the presentation. Um, we're going to start with a video overview of the of Hollywood Food Coalition as a whole. We have um, three programs that we're going to talk about um, uh, to give you the general idea of what the organization does, which is our flagship program, uh, the Community Dinner, which has served a nightly dinner every single night without fail since 1987 our community exchange program, which is our food rescue and sharing program and our community wellness, which provides essentials um, and navigation to social services. Um, so we can go to the next slide and, and watch the video and we'll go from there. Oh, we are not working? hearing, I'm not hearing the audio. Uh, I know we did when we tested this right before, so I don't know what, um, if anything was done differently at that time. Okay, um, Natalie says you should be able to check mark a box in settings. Um, I think that would be on your end, Darren. There's a share sound in setting. It may have had something to do with the recording. I'm not sure. That's the only difference from now from our um, our practice. <laughs> yeah, sorry, where would that option be? I don't think I changed anything, but. Yep, unfair what you're sharing right now. And then when you reshare it, there's a checkbox to include computer audio. Thank you for that. And thank you everyone for some uh, patience with some te technical difficulties bound to happen sometimes. Darren, are you seeing that? Uh, it sounds like it'll pop up if you reshare that maybe you'll see that option. and. If if it really isn't working, we can um, drop the link to this YouTube video in the chat at least. Was the share option on Zoom for the for the audio? Yeah, Darren. So if you go ahead and hit the share screen, that green icon. Mm -hmm. When you go ahead and pick which window you want to share, on the bottom left, there's a little toggle box to share sound. Okay, let me try again. Sorry, guys. Aha. Got it. Got it. Perfect. Thanks. Welcome to. The Hollywood Food Coalition. Our longest standing program is our community dinner program, which is located right here in Hollywood, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The team prepares a five-course restaurant-style meal from rescued food through our community exchange. At the dinner, we strive to create a welcoming and dignified experience that allows us to build trusting relationships with all of our guests. To be able to plan a menu as a chef, to be able to provide nutritional meals as a chef for our guests, the idea of hospitality really does excite me. On average, we serve about 200 to 250 free nutritious meals each night to our unhoused and low-income Angelinos. 
with absolutely no barriers. Leveraging this trust, our community wellness program identifies barriers to meeting their additional health and housing. We collaborate with other local nonprofits to more effectively provide services such as housing navigation, physical, mental health care, and other essential services. We partner with UCLA so that people who are not comfortable going to the hospital can come in and get regular medical care. We have the UCLA Vision Clinic, we have showers, we have haircuts. We try and do all the things that people might need to have access to and make it easy for them to have access in one location. Our Community Exchange is one of our newest programs. It was launched in May of 2020 in response to circumstances brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. There were businesses who wanted to help by contributing their excess food that would otherwise go to waste. And there were also a growing number of nonprofits who struggled to access nutritious foods for their communities. Leveraging technology, we developed a concierge service that allows nonprofits to customize the quantity and type of food they want to receive. We are able to bring in larger donors like farms, distributors, and grocery stores to greatly improve the quantity and quality of food that we are able to rescue and provide to our dinner program and provide to our neighboring community organizations that are feeding those in need. To date, we have served over 130 small and medium-sized nonprofits who would have otherwise been unable to collect from traditional food banks. Some of the temporary shelters that we serve uh, only have like a little hot plate, so they love the fresh romaine, the cucumbers, the squash, all of these fresh tomatoes and things you can eat, just really fresh salads. They absolutely love getting all of the fresh stuff. There's so many stories about why people fall out of house. here and everybody who comes here respects you as a human being, talks to you, engages with you, gets to know your name and helps you connect again with being a person of value. All right, thanks for uh playing the video. I gave a pretty good overview of what the organization does. Um, you know, our dinner program is serving 200 plus meals a night. We really value choice, consistency, um, and uh, part like in order to provide choice, prepared foods is like an essential part of that because it provides a nice variety for our chef to cook with. Also our exchange program, which we'll talk a little bit more about, um, is allowed us to expand the different types of food we get, different proteins, different produce options, um, in addition to prepared foods. Um, if you go to the next slide. So the exchange started in uh, May of 2020, or well, it started in March of 2020 as like an informal program. As places were closing, we were getting more food. We had other community organizations asking for help. And at Hollywood Food Coalition always tries to say yes uh, when people ask us for help. And so uh, you saw a little bit of our kitchen in the video, and it's uh, small enough for the dinner. So trying to run a food sharing program out of that is even more difficult. But we started there for a couple of months and uh, then formalized it as its own program, Community Exchange, in May of 2020, moved to a, a church um, with the goal being to uh, cater to these small to medium-sized social service agencies and really customize like uh, what they want, even to a, like the size of a box. Uh, we have really small recipients. Um, we'll talk about a couple later on. Um, we've rescued over 5 million pounds of food and we've worked with over 145 different recipient organizations. Um, since we started a few years ago, uh, we've moved to a new uh, food warehouse. We've been there since April of 2021. We were able to install uh, a large uh, fridge, a large freezer. We now have a refrigerator van, a refrigerator truck, um, in part thanks to Cal Recycle. And uh, we've been um, expanding from how we originally started, which was working with a lot of local um, restaurants to distributors all the way up to farm level um, and everywhere in between, including prepared foods. Um, so we try to say yes to all types of food. And we created um, a technology that allows us to integrate our recipient database, where we try to collect a lot of information and make it dynamic and stay up to date with our inventory. So we're inventorying all the food we have in our warehouse, and we're customizing those distributions that we're making um, to our recipients. Um, you can go to the next slide. And something about uh, the organization that I find really exciting is the 
holistic approach and bring it full circle. Um, so we really care a lot about building trust uh, through food with our dinner guests. Um, through the exchange, we've built relationships with all these social service agencies and it's through, through wellness program, in addition to handing out essentials like clothing, backpacks, tents, things like that, we're also connecting um, our dinner guests to services that are now part of our network around LA as we try to build out the social safety net and help them navigate you know, these difficult uh, processes. Um, something that we care a lot about is um, you know, the impact food can have beyond just a meal in itself. And one story that has really resonated with us recently is our partnership with a, an, an agency called Housing Works. They are permanent supportive housing. We deliver 40 grocery boxes every week to their um, a different building each week. And the feedback we've gotten so far is that it's helping them retain clients in their programs, which is like so valuable um, to them and to the people in their programs as they uh, try to reintegrate it back into the community. Next slide. Um, so as we've grown, um, it's gone from all the food we recovered being used at our dinner program to now only about 10% is going to our dinner program. 90% is distributed to our network of recipients across LA County and a little beyond. Um, that, you know, part of the reason we made the exchange is we were getting to the point where we were getting more food than we could handle. Um, and we were getting food that, um, you know, wasn't the right fit for our, our kitchen, our clients. And so we realized that that's, that's true for a lot of different recipient organizations that want to serve food. They're not always able to get the exact food they want or, um, with a lot of food recovery organizations, there isn't always a lot of storage. And so we wanted to create storage and we work with donors and food recovery organizations alike to aggregate food to make sure that it can go to a really great place that we know it's going to be used. So there's no pressure. We're trying to relieve the pressure of like making drops that are too big or, in, um, you know, not in the right shape for how they can handle it, or maybe they don't have the right equipment, um, things like that. So as we've uh, grown, we've been able to be really specific with our own dinner program. Um, they're ordering every day. They usually get one or two deliveries from the exchange each day. Um, we have two separate sites um, and they're able to really choose what they want. And that helps our chef uh, design the menu every week. Next slide. So there's a lot of different types of prepared foods we get. Um, one of them is uh, prepared meals that we get from every table or we'll get uh, through replay from Netflix. Um, sometimes they're going directly to our dinner program and we're serving them uh, as as second meal. So we always provide um, a five course meal. We usually have at least three options, including a vegetarian option. Um, and then we do provide a to-go meal um, if people want seconds. And we use uh, these great prepared meals that are really popular um, at our dinner program, in addition to sharing um, with other organizations. Next slide. So we also rescue from different restaurants. So for one example, Panda Express is uh, all prepared food that we're rescuing from them. And we've worked with um, a couple local uh, restaurants here in Hollywood and developed a system for them to uh, basically when they do a line change to safely um, store the excess food. And um, event basically by type, it isn't a lot. You know, they're pretty good about um, not having too much, but there is always a little bit. And we pick up twice a week and that becomes like really valuable and provides a lot of meals. Um, sometimes we serve that to a program directly out of our kitchen. Uh, we share our kitchens on the Salvation Army campus. They have a program called The Way In, um, which is for at-risk youth, and we provide a meal for them every day. And that Panda Express is obviously a huge hit with, with them. Um, so even though it's a little bit at a time, we've developed this system where we, you know, in the end, get quite a lot of meals from Panda Express in, in a safe way. We've also been working on an event service as LA has tons of events and they're at odd hours um, and end really late. So it's pretty difficult to rescue food from them. And we've been working with different events companies to pilot a service where we're able to pick up basically any time of night and store it, transport it and store it safely um, and get it back into the community. So we're looking to grow that over the next, uh, this year and next year um, as more and more events happen and they have some amazing food. We've worked with uh, studios here in LA. Um, one of our biggest ones is NBC Studios. We have developed a fridge program with them. So basically we have several fridges on their lot. And every time a production um, ends a meal, they're able to 
safely store the food in one of the fridges. They text our line and let us know uh, which which fridge it's in. And then we dispatch a driver same day or following day, depending. Um, and that's allowed us to get some another, like another great source of incredibly high quality prepared foods. Um, we have picked up on location for some productions, um, but that's a little bit trickier just because of timing. So we typically try to um, set up fridges on site on, on studios or um, have PA runners like drop directly off, um, like directly from lot to our location if it's close enough. Um, as you can see here, we also take this food at our dinner program and repurpose it into some amazing meals. On the left side, we have our uh, our chef prepared roasted beets and he served them with rainbow carrots, we roasted with honey, rosemary, parsley, and balsamic. Um, and on the right, we had rescued some pulled pork and he uh, remade that with some barbecue sauce some handmade barbecue sauce and provided um, some additional that provided some additional flavor and served it with rice and, and veggies. Um, so it, it adds this like really high quality variety. And because we have this amazing chef in our kitchen, we're able to really do a lot of um, creative things with it and serve like some really tasty uh, meals at our, at our dinner program. Next slide. Uh, so some other restaurants to highlight is we uh, rescue from Prince Street Pizza. Um, so they're uh, donating whole pizzas. Um, we also rescue from a lot of bacon places like Cake Monkey, um, Cantor's. So they have a lot of prepared desserts that are uh, amazing. Um, as I mentioned, they, we have a five course dinner at our dinner program. So that includes a dessert um, every night. Um, and let's go to the, the next one. And just to um, finalize this, we also, you know, as I mentioned, we work with some of these donors, but we also work with recovery organizations like Replay, which is bringing us Netflix meals. Um, we work with food finders to rescue from Sweet Greens. We have a really good thing going here where Sweet, when Sweet Green opens a new um, location and they do training, they train by making hundreds of salads. And then with the help of food finders, we're able to rescue those and either serve them through our dinner or to other recipients and get some amazing uh, salads. We've also rescued from uh, Chipotle. And I mentioned the other, the other ones we're rescuing from. Next slide, please. So one thing that I think is really awesome about um, the exchange and in particular what prepared foods can do is through one of our partners, uh, Genevieve's Garden. Uh, this started because of the exchange. It is at a um, base out of a church in Hollywood called Blessed Sacrament. Uh, basically, we were working with um, Brother, Brother Henry, who was over there um, in 2020. He wanted to start a lunch, a free lunch every day in Hollywood. And he said, I got a parking lot, I have tables, I have chairs, but just a microwave. And because we were rescuing prepared meals, we were able to start a free lunch every single day, um, well, at least five days a week that has been going on for the past three years and continues to thrive uh, because of prepared food we're rescuing um, at the exchange and they just have our microwave and we're able to make that work. So I think that's a really good example of, of the power of um, what prepared food can do in the, in the food recovery world. Um, another thing that I think is nice is when we rescue food from productions, we've shared with organizations like um, Village Family Services, which is a lot of use. And when they find out they're eating the same food that movie stars have been eating, they get really excited about it and feel, you know, they just really value that food. And um, it's just something really nice, nice to do for um, all of the recipients we have. So prepared foods are great. We are actively trying to grow how we're accessing um, some of these amazing prepared meals companies, all these events, productions, and uh, excited to see it grow with the next tier coming into effect uh, next year. I think that's the last slide. Thank you very much. Appreciate um, you having me on and happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Brian. Uh, it's great to hear the about the great work that the Hollywood Food Coalition is doing. And also like we're saying, what is possible? Um, so we heard what's possible from the generator side and then the food recovery organization side. And both of you shared a, about a lot of great food and making me hungry over here. So um, thanks again to all of our panelists. If we can go to the next slide, we can um, go to our Q&A session. So, here are some of the same reminders um, from a slide that I put earlier in the slide deck. Um, so remember, we are using that Q&A feature uh, rather than the chat or raise hand function. 
and then we will be calling on folks to read their question out loud. We'll allow you to unmute yourself and state your name and affiliation and if there's any additional context. Um, and also we really want to encourage peer sharing. So if there is a question that you have experience in and would like to share something as well, uh, please uh, just indicate peer share before your question or comment, and we'll allow you to unmute and share that as well. We also have uh, an organ or 1383 inbox for any questions that don't get answered or if you would rather send them that way. So we have that on here too. And with that, um, I guess, Ray, if you could move us into our Q&A uh, feature, we will go ahead and get started running through some. We've got a lot of great questions. Absolutely. Thank you, Danielle. So our first question is from an anonymous participant. So I'll go ahead and read it and then pass it off to Michelle Martin's team to go ahead and give a response um, verbally for the recording purposes. The first question is, is there new SB 1383 implementation funding? If so, where do we go to apply? Michelle or- Hi, Ray, I can take that. This is Lori Kikamoto. Uh, manager of the um, grants and payments section. Um, there will be a new cycle, and right now we're in the middle of um, writing the criteria and getting it approved. So um, if you are a member of the SLCP um, mail email list, you will receive information about that. Great, thanks, Lori. Um, our next question comes from Maria Barajas. So uh, you are unmuted on our end. If you could unmute yourself, state your name and affiliation and ask your question, please. Hello, my name is Maria Barajas. I'm the nutrition coordinator for Aspire Public Schools. And my question is, um, if we are a nonprofit organization and um, we are the LA schools that do not have any um, centralized kitchen and provide, we are provided uh, vended meals for all of our schools. Well, what is our, um, basically, well, we're not really sure what tier do we, um, kind of we need to participate. Yeah, thank you, Maria. Um, so it sounds like, um, is that a, a food service provider that's providing meals? Um, they're, right. they're okay. Vended meals, yes. Okay, but it's not um, anybody from that food service provider company that's staying on, on campus to serve those, right? They're just providing them to the school at the beginning of the day, say? Correct. Okay, so yeah, th this has come up uh, a couple times and it's kind of one of those it depends scenarios, just in terms of what the logistics are with that food service uh, provider company. So if they have like a return to vendor kind of model, which is something that we see in grocery stores where they'll sometimes pick up their um, excess inventory, um, then they would be responsible for that recovery. However, if it's being provided to the schools, that school is a tier two generator and they would be responsible for recovery of um, any excess meals that were not served to kids. So this can definitely uh, require some communication between the schools and that company, depending on what their business models are um, or where those storage uh, where access is to, I, I know sometimes it gets into an issue of available um, proper storage, like refrigeration at schools. Um, so I, I hope that helps a little bit depending on that business model. Um, but I know that sometimes this one does require more um, communication. Hey, Danielle, I, I'd also like to just add, um, I wanted to let you know our, our team is following up because we know Aspire has some unique circumstances. And um, we have um, also to look at the charter school and how it fits in with the definition um, and with respect to its relationship to the school district. So our team does plan um, to be following up with you. Um, so if you want to throw your contact information in the chat, um, but I know they're working on um, some responses. So Danielle, that was a great response. Aspire just has some additional unique circumstances being a type of charter school. 
Great. Thank Great. you thank so you much. Thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for that additional uh, context too, Kara. And if we could move on to the next one, I don't know what, what is the next one in the queue. Yes, so the next one is from Alyssa Mitchell. Alyssa, you are unmuted on our end. If you could go ahead and unmute yourself, state your name and affiliation and ask your question. Um, yes, my name is Alyssa Mitchell and I work for the city of Pomona. And we're working on updating our tier one and tier two generator list. And one of the haulers that we're working with mentioned that if a food distributor is a tier one, however, I know that CalRecycle clarified that a food distributor is a is not a tier one. So I, I can go back to the hauler and say, no, we that is not correct. Because I that's where I was confused that they could be a fro and a tier one because like they listed the LA Food Bank as a tier one and another one as the local food recovery as a tier one, I didn't agree, so. Yeah, thanks, Elisa. And um, so yeah, just to clarify, a food distributor is a tier one, but you were asking about uh, the food bank in particular. So um, yeah, that, that would be incorrect because uh, the 1383 definition for a food distributor is a company that distributes food to entities, including but not limited to supermarkets and grocery stores. So a food bank is neither a company nor distributing to those kinds of entities. They're distributing to people in need. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, absolutely. Emily, you're on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so our next question comes in from Allison Schill. Um, you are unmuted on our end. If you could state your name and affiliation and ask your question, please. Thank you. Um, Allison Schill with the Carrot Food Recovery app. And I heard the first presenter, Vanessa, say that they will not allow food trucks, uh, food food prepared in food trucks to be donated. And I just wanted clarification about that because uh, that seems like, especially in oversight, somebody mentioned later with uh, large scale events. Hi, Allison. So it's not that we don't allow it. It's just that code specifically um, has requirements for mobile food operations, right? And one of those um, requirements is that any potentially hazardous food that has been hot held at 135 degrees or above um, on a mobile food facility, whether it's a truck or a cart, shall be destroyed at the end of the operating day. And it's just specifically listed out in the code as a requirement. Um, so something that fits that description would not be able, it has to be destroyed at the end of the day. So could they give it to somebody they it before there? the end of the day? All right. <clears throat> but it couldn't be saved, right? Cooled down, saved and further, further donated. Right, and thank you, Vanessa. I, I know this one has generated a lot of questions because especially, at, you know, a lot of large events we acknowledge, you know, have a lot of those food trucks. I did drop in, um, in response to Allison's question, um, the section that Vanessa read. So that is from the California Health and Safety Code, section 114305D. Um, but I do like the thinking about uh, that language there is at the end of the operating day. And we did have another question here that we'll probably read out loud too, um, that nothing prohibits uh, generators from um, donating to their employees. So just one workaround to I just consider. don't feel like that answer was super clear. So from my understanding, it's that mobile food facilities and temporary food facilities are required to destroy their food at the end of the day if it's been held hot. So therefore, this whole event section that Cal Recycles built out is basically null. Is that correct? Because if it's one thing to give it to staff, right? But we're talking about the actual signing an agreement with a food recovery organization, tracking those donations, etc. And so if they're not supposed to do that, then how would we impose that upon events? Danielle, can I add in one more thing before you answer from the Cal Recycle side? Um, sure. 
I want to just clarify too, so it makes sense to everybody that our, the different operations laid out in the code are, are specific. And so when we talk about an event, it can actually include lots of different uh, permit types or operational types. And so this specific requirement for temp event vendors is really specific to like a street fair booth. So not at, I'll give an example, the San Diego Convention Center that has an event, but they are feeding said event with their full built out permitted, you know, multiple kitchens that are on site. They're essentially catering it, right? And that's much different, although it might be so, so called an event, um, that would be different in our code. Um, because this is really specific to those that are sent, set up with like a couple of tables and a pop-up tent operating at your local farmer's market or your local street fair. So I'll let Danielle answer the other questions, but just kind of to clarify what, what that means. Yeah, thank you for that additional context, Vanessa. Um, yeah, not not all events um, are our food truck only. So that's definitely something to consider. Um, another consideration could be if that food truck has other um, operations that do fall into those tier one or tier two definitions, such as if they're, uh, if it's from coming from a large restaurant or something like that, um, or a wholesale food vendor. Um, but yes, those are considerations that you, when looking at the event as a whole to, to consider with this knowledge of the that code about the food trucks. Can I ask just one more clarifying question? Um, Go ahead. So yeah. is, if if we, there's an event and they've posted their, their food to Carrot and they're a food truck in particular, if they can take the food at 10 p.m. at the end of an event to an organization that's reserved it or if the organization can pick it up, that's fine. But if it if it needs to be saved for the next day because no organizations are open, they need to destroy it. Is that only for the county of San Diego or other county health departments also sharing a similar code? This is in the California Retail Food Code. And so it, they wouldn't be able to pick it up and give it to another organization. It should be destroyed by that mobile food operator. But if they're able to drive it at the end of the day to a nonprofit organization? No. It should be under their control. So in, as soon as they pass it on, they can't verify that that's being met. They sh they need to destroy it at the end of their working day. But if it's within that working day, they mm -hmm. can they yeah. can't transport it to a nonprofit. They don't have any control over it after it leaves their hands and goes to that nonprofit. And the regulation is for that mobile food operator. So they have to be in compliance with that. And if they're dropping it off at a food recovery agency, they don't have any control over when it's served or moved forward. So because it has to be served by that day, got it. Correct. So I would say, you know, people walking by at the event, hey guys, I have 10 extra hot dogs. You guys want them? You know what I mean? Just giving it to people at the event or to other workers at the event to, you know what I mean? Like right then and there for them to eat at that moment. Otherwise I got to toss these, you know, if you guys want them. Um, that's going to be the best bet, but they're not going to be able to drop it off at another organization and lose control over that food product because they're responsible for complying with that section. And this does and for the whole California. This is in the California Retail Food Code, so this will be throughout the whole state. Yeah, this does spark one more question that um, actually, Vanessa, maybe you've dealt with this. I know there are some apps out there that can kind of uh, discount or, or give it straight to a consumer, so it wouldn't be going to an organization, but it would be going straight to somebody um, to consume that food. Um, I don't know if something like that um, would be. Um, you know, approved with this in mind, but it, it's something that we could also d discuss. We're, we're certainly not trying to, the point of this webinar is certainly not to uh, diminish uh, edible food recovery efforts out there. This, But uh, I will say that food trucks, um, it can be hard to fit into one of our tier one or tier two definitions as is. Um, so that that's also something to consider that this isn't, um, they, they weren't particularly included in our, um, our, our regulations in terms of those definitions. 
um, since they don't really meet the definition of a restaurant or a wholesale food provider, food service provider. Um, so just wanting to note that, um, that that's, that was not the, our main focus either. But I do acknowledge that we have a lot of events with, with tasty food and I like Vanessa's suggestions of still thinking about, um, you know, making sure that food is not going to waste. And uh, Megan Browning asked a similar question and hopefully we were able to address that, but Megan, you are unmuted on our end if you'd like to provide any additional context or request any different clarifications from Vanessa or Danielle. Yeah, I, I will just quickly clarify because from a record keeping and reporting standpoint, we have record of an event over 2000. And if this event is only using food trucks, we just document that they're using food trucks only and therefore they do not have a contract with an edible food recovery organization. Yes, that, that sounds um, feasible to me. We don't have official guidance on this specific scenario, but that's similar to the guidance that we've given. Um, if, say, a commercial edible food generator doesn't have excess edible food, it's just the burden of proof is on them to demonstrate that to um, anybody coming by to inspect for those requirements. Um, so if they could demonstrate that that's the reason why they don't have a contract, um, then that should be um, seen by the inspector and, and you know, considered compliant. Okay. Hey, yeah. Danielle, I just wanted to add, um, and I, maybe, maybe it's a point of clarification for me. Um, you know, the scenario that was just presented is I'm a food truck at an event and so I don't have to comply, but it, it also depends on the type of edible food that's available to be recovered, right? You could have edible food that doesn't have to be maintained or, or you know, doesn't hit that high temperature. I'm not going to say this correctly, but so I'm wondering, should we caveat a little bit? Yeah, thank you for uh, acknowledging that too. I mean, it, there are a lot that have that, uh, that this does apply to, but you're correct that it's not just food trucks. It's food trucks that serve a specific kind of food, um, those foods that meet the temperature requirements um, presented in Vanessa's presentation. Yeah, thank you. I Thanks. think maybe I'll follow up more a little bit. I forgot to say um, I'm from city of San Diego. So I think with a lot of events, that happen here are on such a large scale, and I'm sure it's the same for other jurisdictions, but we don't get into the weeds of like, if you have 27 food trucks, please provide what type of food you're providing at each one. A lot of event organizers are going to have an issue with this because the food truck itself doesn't have to comply with the edible food recovery. It's now on the event, but now the event's having to do this extra work to check all 27 food vendors on top of everything that they're doing with this event to figure out if what ones have to donate food. So I would like maybe this yeah. to be on everyone's radar for- Yeah, yeah, food. you know, I mean, I'd like to acknowledge that. I mean, it does put uh, onus and responsibility on the event. And um, you're, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. Again, I mean, these, the, you know, the requirements are intended to recover the maximum amount of edible food that can be safely recovered. And so, I mean, there's, there's going to be some discretion there and we're really looking to, you know, the, the jurisdictions to work with those events and take a reasonable approach, but there could still be, um, you know, an event, you know, there could be edible food that can be safely recovered. And, and so that is a responsibility on those events to help figure that out. Um, is it always going to work out exactly? Probably not, um, especially if it's an event that happens once and goes away. So, you know, we'd be happy to follow up and, and work through some of those um, scenarios. Yeah, thank you, Kara. This is obviously a big topic. And so we're, we're happy to have um, continued discussions on it. But um, maybe we should move on to um, some other topics while we have these great um, panelists on with us. We can take advantage of answering some more. Okay, thanks, Danielle. Um, 
So our next question comes from Sierra Lowe. You are unmuted on our end. If you could unmute yourself, um, state your name and affiliation and ask your question, please. Yeah, hi, thanks so much. Uh, my name is Kira Lowe. I'm the program manager of the Santa Clara County Food Recovery Program. Um, and my question was for um, uh, Vanessa, I think. Um, yeah, Vanessa. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak to seafood donations specifically. We've had that come up a few times, um, I think on the last webinar or the one before um, with some issues or, or a permit required by food recovery organizations to recover that food. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that's in CalCode or something you could speak to, but I just wanted to see if you had any input there. Thanks. Um, ish. Uh, let's see. So seafood, um, it really is going to depend on kind of what they're doing. So seafood can be recovered. It's just figuring out who's who, what's what. So, um, you know, is it something that's coming from a commercial fisherman? We have some sports fishermen's boats that when they have extra catch, you know, they would like to donate it. So sometimes the California Fish and Game and wildlife can be involved. Um, and then, you know, other times, depending on what they're doing with the fish, it might be the California Department of Public Health. Um, you know, if they need a HACCP plan, a seafood HACCP, depending on how they're handling it, if they're packaging it, et cetera. Um, so that wouldn't be something that would necessarily go to the locals, but would go more to the state. So I would encourage you, whoever is, is wanting to do that, to reach out to CDPH, the California Department of Public Health, um, or your local environmental health, and maybe they can help guide you to the right person. Um, but it's all going to be kind of based on what the operation is or what the recovery looks like and the handling. That's fair. Yeah. Sorry, I should have been a bit more specific as well. I guess I'm thinking specifically of raw seafood from supermarkets. Yeah, it shouldn't really be a problem, just depending on what they're doing with it after. Okay, thank you. If they're going to be trying to, you know, vacuum pack it or different things that require additional oversight. Um, Ray or Emily, do we have another question? Yes, sorry. Our next question is for Hollywood Food Coalition from Kelly Gaherty. Kelly, you're unmuted on our end. If you'd like to go ahead and unmute yourself, state your name and affiliation, and ask your question. We might have lost Kelly. I'll go ahead and ask. Uh, what percent of food does the Hollywood Food Coalition purchase versus recover? What are the most difficult challenges that come with recovered food? Um, well, it was all recovered food until just this year. And now we have a very small budget to purchase some food, which we um, do occasionally. And it really is mostly to boost our dinner program to like get hard to find stuff like oils and spices and things to really add a lot of flavor. So still a very high percentage, like 99% is recovered food. Um, and it just, just changed this year that we actually like purchased some food up, maybe some like emergency situations in the past. It's been like basically all recovered food. The second part was one of the challenges. Yes. Yeah. Um, for us right now, it's, you know, obviously food recovery is logistically intense. Um, it's quite expensive. Our warehouse right now is, um, a little too small for actually much too small for our current uh, ability and actual capacity for what we can rescue. So um, it, right now, and especially in LA, it's, it's finding more cool storage, more space um, and expanding the, the fleet of vehicles is our, is our biggest challenge. Um, and, and building out like for us, for our program, like we try to do a very specific thing um, and we tried to create new you know ways of doing it. So for us, a big challenge was staffing up and creating roles and figuring out how all of our processes are, processes are going to work, building our technology out. So um, we can handle all these logistics and do everything that we want to do. So those are just a face. Thanks, Brian. 
Um, our next question is going to be from Cassie Bartholomew. You are unmuted on our end. If you could unmute yourself, state your name and affiliation and ask your question, please. Hi, good afternoon. Casey Bartholomew from Stop Waste. I had a question for either Claire or Alicia around Chesta and hunger. Uh, I know we have several uh, food facilities here in Alameda County that uh, have partnerships with Shefta and Hunger, and I just wanted to learn a little bit more around how the food donation contract with uh, Shefta and Hunger uh, works. Is the contract with the um, between uh, Good Eating and Shefta and Hunger, or is it between your company and the food recovery organization that ultimately receives that food? Uh, because I know in our county, Chefs and Hunger operates more like a food recovery service, and ultimately there's another organization that, that distributes that donation. Yeah, I can try to answer that, Cassie. So my understanding is that our um, contract is directly with Chefs and Hunger, and then they have sub subcontracts with all of um, the other organizations that they partner with. Um, but it's interesting, actually, in conjunction with White Pony, um, because we've been working directly with White Pony at one site, and then we're thinking about potentially also partnering directly with um, Chefs to End Hunger, and then letting them know that we want those donations from that particular site to go to this specific end user, but um, we haven't successfully done that yet. Thanks, Claire. Thank you. Um, our next couple questions come from Susan Blackman. Susan, you had a couple questions for Brian. Um, you could go ahead and unmute yourself, state your name and affiliation. And go ahead and ask uh, your questions. Hi, so I've got them all over the place. So I've actually, that's Susan Blackman um, on the NICRA board and also uh, Blackman Consulting. If you could just ask the questions I prefer because otherwise I have to dig them out. Thank you. Sure, let's see. Um, the first one is, when do you weigh the donated food and do you include the weight of recovered food that has gone bad? And what is your relationship with Feeding America? Um, so we weigh the food as it's coming in and we inventory it. We do track food and weigh food that is um, comes in inedible and we mark it as inedible. So we, we try to keep you know data on how much food is... Um, going to organics recycling and we try to track what we received that way and what went to organics under our care and we try to be really fast um, and have ways to urgently share stuff that's still edible but towards the end of its life so we try to really make sure nothing goes inedible under our care but we definitely do receive food that's inedible and that's weighed with all the other food as it's coming in and kind of separated in our system uh, uh we don't uh rest like share get food or share food with Feeding America, but we um, do work um, on the LA Food Recovery Alliance uh, with uh, LA Food, LA Regional Food Bank. Um, they're a part of that. So we do collaborate on um, things through um, this task force, which is part of the LA Food Policy Council. And the final- I was also actually wondering, Brian, where, um, what's your source of funding? You said that your program's very extensive. It is quite expensive. Uh, we get funding through um, mostly through grants, um, foundations, and individual donations. Um, and we do try to create other ways to, um, we're trying to create ways of generating revenue to make the programs more sustainable. Um, but mostly right now it's uh, through those fundraising efforts. Thanks, Brian. Um, our next question comes from Molly Reeves. If you could unmute yourself, state your name and affiliation and ask your question, please. Hi, thank you. I'm just trying to find my question. I believe it was for um, the, um, it was for good eating companies. So, um, it had to do with, oh, are there requirements that need to be met for the labels that are put on the aluminum chill plates? Um, I know for chefs to end hunger, when you, um, they give you the boxes with the items to donate, you have the chill plates and the labels. And I was just wondering if any labels need, specific needs need to be met. 
That's a great question for Chef Alicia. And unfortunately, she did have to hop off of the call. Um, I know that we label the items um, and uh, I imagine we label the, the you know, top seven allergens if there are any. Um, but I don't know if Chefs to End of Hunger has specific requirements on the labels. Thank you. I can jump in and add, Molly. Um, it's also going to depend on what the food banks require. So some of the food banks have very specific things that they want to see on the labels. Um, so you definitely want to check with them or the food recovery agency that's working with them. Um, and the California Retail Food Code has some like really basic general, like common name of food, the address where it's prepared, just some really basic items that could go on a label of a packaged food. Yeah, and to reiterate that point, Vanessa, we do obviously label what, what kitchen it was prepared in and the, what time it was um, put to temp. Thank you again. If there's no other contributors on this one, um, I will go ahead and open up the floor to Colleen Foster. You have a few questions here, Colleen. Um, would you like to start with your first question regarding tier two inspections? Sure. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Thank you. Let me go back to that first question. And, and really, I, a couple of my questions are really around that transport time. So um, I really, great presentations all around, and I appreciate uh, San Diego County Health Department being here today. I'm trying to understand that 30-minute transport time and, and really understand how how do so I'll do 90? Ask your organizations work with them that, right? So he's collecting stuff and distributing it throughout the day or the next day. So how do you meet that 30-minute limitation? The other questions were about the special events, and I think we're kind of we went through a lot of those questions. But I think I think that's my first series of questions. Okay. Um, our next question is from uh, Dan, uh, Emily. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm not sure if we addressed that question. Oh, I. I, I Pauline, I think that question may have been for Vanessa. You're talking about the 30 minute time window. Yeah, it's for Vanessa to explain the 30 minutes. And then for, you know, the Hollywood Food Coalition and Chefs to End Hunger to also explain how they how they do their operations within that time frame. Like even in San Diego County, it's hard to work with the feeding agencies for them to have multiple pickups because, you know, they can only have a pickup and they got to get it to that final endpoint within 30 minutes. I mean, that's that's challenging. You know, you can't get two miles in Los Angeles within 30 minutes in certain places. So how do we really make that work? I can leave that one for, for Brian on how to make it work. Um, but the, the code does say that if um, you're transporting food, um, that it shouldn't really go out of temperature, right? So your cold food should not go above 45 and your hot food should not go below 135 and the transport time should not be more than 30 minutes. Um, it is a huge challenge. Um, I agree. It's it's a problem that we see a lot out there, especially with food recovery agencies. Um, I know um, our I've spoken extensively with Speeding San Diego about it, and they work really closely with all of their partner agencies. So locally here in San Diego, they partner with about 500 organizations, and they specifically work with them and help them to, to meet that, you know, plan out the routes and, and meet that. Um, so there's a huge benefit to being partnered um, with a big permitted food bank that can help you with some of those logistics. Um, but I'll let one of the food recovery agencies kind of chime in on how they they manage it personally. Um, yeah, for us, we have a refrigerated, refrigerated van and a refrigerated truck. Um, so that allows us to um, keep things at temperature. Um, but that actually is how we're able to expand like the events for service, for example. So prepared foods in the past, um, we've um, worked with a lot of like neighborhood stuff that's really close. Like, as you mentioned, there's really heavy traffic. So because we have the reefer vehicles, we're able to go to a wider geographical area. And before that, if we were picking up prepared foods, we'd have to make sure in advance, like it was it was coming straight to us and close enough with traffic considered 
Um, and we also work with other uh, recovery organizations that have uh, refrigerated vehicles or do the same type of preparation. Okay, so so then if I just understand it correctly, it, if it stays within temp, you can have a longer transport time than 30 minutes, right? So really the, the solution is is providing, you know, refrigerated trucks or some sort of refrigerated devices or, or temp devices, um, you know, to our feeding agencies. Is that, is that? Uh, so is that heard, kind of the solution to, to getting around that? I don't know that there's logistically an item that's going to fit in somebody's personal vehicle that's going to adequately hold food cold, right? So like freezer blankets and little things that you use to assist, they're not really going to really hold it cold, um, like a refrigerated truck. So I would definitely try to focus more on keeping the trip at 30 minutes or less and having, you know, putting that time and money and resources into like getting more drivers or planning out the trips rather than trying to get some sort of like big piece of equipment that somebody is going to have to haul around in their sedan right? And, and pick up food. I don't know how, how feasible that will be. Well, that's really helpful, Vanessa, because a lot of the funding that's being put towards edible food recovery, it doesn't necessarily support staffing. It supports infrastructure, right? So we can buy refrigerated trucks and equipment, and it's important to understand from feeding agencies what they need to expand their scope. But I think it's, it's also relative to the fact that we need funding to support feeding agencies, the staffing, you know, the volunteers to do all of these pickups across um, these counties. Yeah. Okay. Um, our next question comes from Andrea Richards. Um, if you could unmute yourself, state your name and affiliation, ask your question, please. Uh, hi there, um, Andrea Richards. I'm the food rescue manager at the San Luis Obispo Food Bank. Um, my question is for Vanessa. Uh, you had mentioned, if I understand correctly, that the onus is on the um, food facility operators to decide what is safe to donate um, when it comes to prepared food. Um, from a food recovery organization perspective and um, as a partner distribution organization under Feeding America, I believe we're required to follow the Feeding America guidance um, as well when rescuing prepared food. So I just wanna be sure I understand the regulations that we need to follow correctly. And I was a little confused with the um, advice to defer to the food facility operators. Just hoping for some clarification there. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'll clarify a little bit. So we uh, work a lot with our local city jurisdictions, right? Those that are actually enforcing SB 1383. And what seems to come up a lot is that they're feeling this pressure, or this is my interpretation, right? As they're asking me questions to sort of be this person that's evaluating the food and saying, you can donate this here, you can donate this, look at this, this is all edible and safe food to donate. And feeling that they need to know more about food safety, right? And the reality is that they don't. That really, you know, that food facility operator is required to donate the maximum amount of edible food. And they should be deciding, right, based on how they've handled it, you know, maybe they have something in a case that they go, hey, that refrigerator broke, right? And I, I can't be serving that. Like that was out of temperature and I, that, that food is not safe to donate. That, those are the kind of decisions that are on them to decide and not necessarily on the, the inspector, right? To, to make that decision. And so that's kind of more a little bit what I meant. Um, as a food recovery agency, right? You will of course be be following, you know, normal food safety practices as required by the retail food code, but also um, as you're with your partnership with Feeding America, they're going to have their own requirements because they have their own best practices and things that they have determined that they um, won't pick up, right, or won't allow you to accept. And that would be something that you would work with them on as well. Hopefully that helps. Okay, gotcha. That's helpful. Thank you.
Ray, are, are you, you're on mute if you're. Sorry, thank you. Our next question is from Shira Lane. Shira, you are unmuted on our end. If you'd like to go ahead and unmute yourself, state your name and affiliation, ask your question regarding SB 54. Hi, my name is Shira Lane. I'm with Atrium 916. We're a creative innovation center for sustainability. My question was, um, how is this working with SB 54? How are organizations preparing for SB 54? Kind of moving away from single use plastic and styrofoam. I did see, you know, a lot of styrofoam and a lot of styrofoam is used with donations. Um, and um, what what's going to happen with reusables? And is that something that we'll be able to incorporate? Thank you. I can jump in here. Um, I love this question, and it's something that I think about a lot um, because we are working to move towards reusables as much as possible in all of our kitchens. Um, it's a matter of um, having the right facilities to wash those um, large scale uh, pans. So if we, you know, if we were to purchase those pans, we'd need to make sure that there was a process for um, sanitizing them, washing them, storing them, and then getting them back. Um, so it's it's definitely something that's on our mind, something that we're thinking about, um, trying to build some infrastructure and work with like-minded suppliers to um, move the needle in that direction. Yeah, this is kind of, I just wanted to add just one quick thought on this. SB 54 is just forming up. So we don't have answers to this question right now. We do have a group that's focused on it. And uh, just like this and a few other areas that we've been discussing today, I think it, it deserves further discussion. We'll definitely share that question with the SB54 group. And since I have the mic open, I did want to mention that um, I have seen some discussion in the chat about the need for clarity uh, that we already discussed on venue and event. Um, edible food recovery, how that applies to food trucks. And um, we're certainly not trying to confuse anything here. Uh, we want to help clarify it and can work on a you know, frequently asked question to try and do that. Um, and uh, as Kara offered up uh, specific discussions about it too, if you have questions like that, we're uh, supportive of doing that. Thanks. Thanks, Kyle. Um, our next question comes from Nicholas Vallejo, uh, and it looks like they're not on the chat anymore. So um, I'll just read it aloud. Nicholas writes, curious as to why the word destroy is used instead of composted for expired foods. Yeah, I'm sorry, Vanessa, go ahead. I didn't know if you had an answer to this one. Um, there's nothing that talks about expired foods. Expired foods can be donated after their expiration date. Are we talking about maybe the mobile, the hot foods and the temporary vet foods, I'm guessing? Um, the code literally uses the word destroyed. I don't have an answer on why it was written that way, um, but that's actually the, the word that's that's used. So, you know, obviously this has been in there for a long time, way before SB 1383. Um, so that's just the word that's been in there. Yeah, I will say good good call out that it's uh, it's not um, in our programs. That's California Health and Safety Code language, um, not CalRecycle language. But um, yes, if you're complying with 1383 on the organic side of things, that's correct that it should be composted. Kyle, I don't know if you had anything else to add on that. No, that, that's it. That. It should be otherwise managed in the organics recycling stream. So uh, it's a good call out for sure. And is that something that can change. Putting on the list, thanks. We do have a number of requests for um, this Q&A and different resources that we can provide. So we are noting that um, and hopefully we'll be able to get that out to you as soon as possible. Um, quick reminder that this is being recorded so you will have um, all of this discussion available to you via our department YouTube channel. Uh, we'll hope We'll hopefully have it up within the next week once it becomes ADA accessible and get the, it totally transcribed. Um, our next question, and maybe our last question, we're coming up at the top of the hour, is from Casey Fritz. Casey, 
you are unmuted on our end, if you'd like to go ahead and unmute yourself, state your name and affiliation and ask your question. Maybe, Maybe we should just yeah. Go I'll ahead. go ahead and read it. To clarify, schools without an on-site food facility qualify as tier two generators if they have leftover meals from a food service provider. So the um, I want to clarify that the generator here, as the tier two generator, is the local education agency. So even if an individual school doesn't have an on-site food facility, if that school district has a food facility within it, they are a tier two generator. Um, so that that might answer the question if, if you were looking at it at a school level versus the district level. Um, but then, as I uh, mentioned previously, too, with the food service provider, it can depend on that business model. Um, they would still be liable, though, for recovering, making sure that those uh, leftover meals were being recovered if the food service provider has provided those meals um, to the school and does not have a business model where they pick them up. Thanks. Danielle, did you want to give a little more time for one more question? Yeah, I, I'll only take, you know, maybe two or three minutes for closing us out. So we might have time for one or two more. Okay. Um, Allison Schill just put a question into the pane. Allison, you're unmuted on our end. Uh, recent question was, are there any plans to readdress the health code regarding donating food from these food trucks or mobile food producers? That's a good question. I don't have any, I don't know, Vanessa, I see you popped your video on. I don't know if you have any insight on that. Not that I'm aware of. So again, yes, not not our wheelhouse, but um, something that maybe legislators could be made aware of. <laughs> we definitely have some more time for a couple more, I think. Okay. Um, Allison went ahead and gave the clapping emoji. So we're happy with that response. Um, let's see. Alyssa Mitchell, you had a question regarding um, inspections on tier twos. Um, seems like we have a lot of questions on those. So um, Alyssa is no longer online. So I'll go ahead and read it. Are cities required to conduct tier two inspections for public schools or only private schools. We are updating a list that did not include the public schools in our jurisdiction. We are not sure if we would add these to public schools or add these public schools to our tier two list. I have not um, heard of a situation where a public school does not fall into that local education agency definition. Um, I don't know if maybe Kara has any more insight on that. Um, because it, it's my impression that they would always fall into a school a public school district, and therefore, um, if they have a, a food facility on site within that district, as I mentioned, they would be considered a tier two generator. Yeah, I, I'm, it might be helpful to get clarification um, from the person that asked. So when we talk about tier two, as Danielle said, it's the school district that is considered the tier two generator if any of their facilities have an on-site um, food facility. So it's not the individual school sites that are the tier two, it's the district as a whole. It's just the way that we, we wrote the definitions and the regulations. Is that helpful? Unfortunately, and just in case, if it was um, asked, kind of backwards, um, private schools are not considered local education agencies. Those fit more of the definition of like a private business and they're not actually included in, in our definitions. So that it's possible that maybe that just was switched around there. <laughs> I hope that helps. Yeah, unfortunately, Alyssa is no longer online, but um, again, with any of these questions, if you wanted to Further clarify, please submit the questions to our SLCP inbox and we'll get back to you um, in a timely manner. Um, I think we can open, oh, Sierra Lowe had a follow-up question to that. Sierra, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? 
Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to to confirm. Um, even though they don't meet that local education agency uh, definition, they can still meet the restaurant definition if the square footage or and receipts meet that requirement. Correct. I did see this question come up um, in the Q and A as well, and we had some um, behind the scenes that this might be something we we bring to our uh, legal team just because the definition of a restaurant does include um, primarily engaged in the sale of food, and at uh, an education uh, facility, that's that's their primary. Um, goal, but there could be so many different um, business models too, where if they're actually, uh, you know, if it's not the school that's serving those meals, and if they are um, kind of outsourcing that to a business that's then providing that, then I could definitely see that meeting the restaurant definition. So I think it's it's kind of one of those case-by-case -case basis, but uh, it's something that we do want to talk about a little bit more too. Yeah, Danielle, I just, it'd be good to get a little more specific information on that. So if you could reach out and let us know about that, it'd be good. Sure, yep. Thank you. Uh, we are at 2.59, so I think that's probably when we should cut it for the Q&A. Um, however, yes, we uh, these will be transcribed, um, so we will be going through them. Um, and as Ray mentioned, feel free to follow up in the inbox as well. That might be a quicker way um, to get answered. And I want to say thank you again so much to our panelists for um, laying that groundwork of the food safety requirements. I know we had a lot of questions on it. Um, as Kyle mentioned, we'll be also thinking about some updating some FAQs on some of these because we did have a lot of frequently asked questions that we saw today. Um, so thanks again to all of our panelists um, for showing what is possible with recovering prepared foods. I know it is something that is new for a lot of people, new for these jurisdictions to implement this, um, but this kind of peer sharing and discussion, um, I hope is helpful to hear. And uh, thank you everybody for participating, um, for submitting all of your questions and comments. And again, this will be recorded and posted uh, to our YouTube channel. Thanks again. Danielle, just to, just to echo some of the comments I'm seeing come in, a standing ovation to you for facilitating this and for the rest of the team helping do this. So very much appreciated, really appreciate our panelists too. So thank you all.